I want to talk about this uh, hearing and the meaning of hearing in Shin Buddhism. Uh, hearing is important not, not only in Shin Buddhism, but also in, in all Buddhist traditions or in all religious traditions. You know, Christianity emphasizes the importance of hearing too. And all Buddhists consider that hearing, uh, hearing to the words of the teachers marks the beginning of Buddhism. Uh, for example, all B Buddhists recite the threefold refuge. And uh, you, you all recite this in, in the service. At the beginning of the three refuges, we say, difficult is it to receive uh, human form, but now we are living it. Difficult is it to hear the Dharma, uh, but we are already hearing it. So, you know, we emphasize the importance of hearing. And we also say the peerless, profound, and wondrous Dharma is rare to encounter even in many hundreds and thousands of kalpas, now we are privileged to hear and receive. The privilege to hear and receive. So the word hear is uh, used in the three refuges three times. Three times. And uh, so, you know, we say how fortunate we are to, to be able to meet the Buddha and listen, hear his words. So in this way, all Buddhists talk about the importance of hearing. But concerning hearing, I want to point out one fundamental difference, one, fun, one fundamental difference between Shin Buddhism and the other Buddhist traditions. The teachers of other Buddhist traditions tell us that hearing is also important. They say the meditation is important, the keeping precept is important, and hearing is also important. That's the way other Buddhists uh, talk about this. But in Shin Buddhism, our teachers tell us that hearing alone, hearing alone is important. Uh, in other Buddhist traditions, uh, they say hearing is one of many practices one should perform in Buddhism. But our teachers tell us hearing is the only thing, only thing necessary for attaining ultimate liberation. They tell us that we are, uh, we ha have only to perfect our hearing throughout our lives. Uh, so the, in a sense, you know, Shinra Shani would say, hearing, if you become the true hearer, listen, that is liberation itself. There's no other form of liberation apart from being a perfect listener. Renyo Shani famously said, but the Dharma culminates in hearing. Chomon wa Poa Chomoni skill. Buddha Dharma culminates in hearing. So uh, we cannot emphasize the importance of hearing uh, as far as Shindan's teaching is uh, concerned. Okay. So the, uh, now uh, let me get into the uh, first uh, topic on page one. And, uh, 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 I, I want to uh, discuss the hearing within the context of Indian Mahayana Buddhism, specifically within Yogacara tradition. Probably some of you never heard the word Yogacara. Uh, in Indian Mahayana tradition, Yogacara is considered the climax or the culmination of the uh, Mahayana tradition. The Yogacara is otherwise known as a tradition of mind holiness. Actually, you know, if you know the name Vasubandhu, he's a second patriarch, according to Shindan, Vasubandhu, or Seshin, or Tenjin, 
and he uh, systematized this transition. But anyway, uh, this Yamachara represents the climax of Mahayana, and this tradition emphasizes importance of hearing. And I believe this is a kind of doctrinal background of Shindan Shonin's teaching. That's why we are going to study. Okay. Uh, since I don't have much time, I, can, I try to give you the kind of outline of the Yogacara view of hearing as a basis of Shindan's uh, uh, teaching of hearing. Okay. Here, the first issue I want to discuss is the two worlds. Okay. So the Buddhism talks about two worlds, world of uh, samsara and the dharma. Dharma means ultimate truth, okay, dharma truth. Two worlds, actually, okay, two worlds. And uh, so this is a world of, of the, uh, the, actually this is a world all of us are living initially. This is a world Shakyamuni initially lived and moved to the world of enlightenment or the, the dharma, okay. So the, this world was ignorance, attachment, and suffering, okay? And uh, human words are used in this context. Okay? This is the world of ultimate truth, and human, you know, this is the world beyond human words. Okay? So that's how Buddhism defines these two uh, worlds. Okay? So the Shakyamuni initially lived, all of us initially lived here. Okay? I use a boat here. Okay? And uh, this is our uh, human direction. And uh, uh, you know, this, this is Shakyamuni's life. Okay? You imagine this. This is the life of Shakyamuni. Shak when he was Shak Shakyamuni was young, okay? he was going this way, upward, okay? upward. And the, he, initially he didn't have uh, so many object of attachment. Okay? So the going was very smooth, but uh, as he grew, he started to accumulate these objects of attachment, possession, or status, or things like that. Okay. So the, as he <laughs> loaded himself with this kind of positive values, objects of attachment, this going started to become difficult, okay, difficult. Because the truth is impermanence. Impermanence, <laughs> actually, this is a, the Dharma is something that, that is continuously moving and changing. But uh, our inclination, our Shakyamuni inclination was you not know, want to have something fixed. See, he became attached to all kinds of fixed values. Okay? So that he gradually realized his going was not easy. He initially it was easy, but uh, he, he, he started to realize see, because of his attachment to various things, and the tr you know, truth is coming from opposite direction, impermanence. So he realized someday I have to lose everything I'm cherishing, okay? you know, position and status, things like that. And even my youth, health, life are going to be lo lost. Okay? That was a realization. He was kind of intimidated by this truth. See, that's why. He couldn't live his life peacefully any longer, and he, you know, he left his palace to seek the way. Okay. That was the uh, Shakyamuni's uh, life, and uh, having experienced difficulty in going against the flow, the reality of suffering, Shakyamuni left his life in the palace, and he started uh, his search uh, for the way to transcend the difficulty. Then. At the age of 35, having spent six years in difficult practices, Shakyamuni attained enlightenment. When he attained enlightenment, he gained insight into the truth of impermanence. Impermanence. Uh, he realized that there was nothing in this world, uh, there was nothing permanent. <laughs> in this world. So we could say his insight into the, the truth of impermanence was the content of his enlightenment. If he thought uh, that he could have something, something permanent within himself and became attached to it, it became the cause of suffering. When clearly recognized 
the absoluteness, absoluteness of the truth of impermanence, and kind of became one with it. See, so the key, uh, so the, this, this is a certain dharma, okay, truth. And so the, he gradually turned into this direction, and when he was 35, he clearly understood that this is absolute. And his whole direction was turned around like this. Okay? So the, this deep insight into the absoluteness of the truth of impermanence, okay? that was the uh, content of his enlightenment. So that was when he was five, 35, and the, since then, he, he lived his life becoming one with the truth of impermanence. Okay? In that sense, he was liberated from his attachment to all these fixed values. Okay? That he was attached to these uh, fixed values. Okay? Uh, but <laughs> these values are uh, uh, just imagined reality. Okay? Uh, reality itself is a continuous flow of life. It's a continuous change. The impermanent. So he recognized the futility of it and became one with it. So this is the life of Shakyamuni. Okay? So the, he now belongs to this world of Dharma. See? But then talks about two, two, two worlds. Okay? So, the, uh, so the boat turned around like 180 degree turn. Okay? And, and so the, he was very happy to attain this. Okay? So the, uh, uh, he was in the, in the Samadhi. Selflessness. This is the self, okay? Selflessness. He was so happy to have attained the Dharma or the state of selflessness. Okay? Self, selflessness, the absence of the self. Okay? This self is negated. But that self means the self, the fixed self, permanent self that he thought he had. But the, the permanent self he thought he had didn't exist. Okay? So, <laughs> Selflessness means he, he realized everything in him was dharma. Dharma fullness. See? Dharma ness, fullness was reality. So the, if you recognize the truthfulness of the dharma fullness, then you recognize the, the mistake in, in being attached to the self. Okay? That is called selflessness. See? Dharma fullness and selflessness are the same thing. <laughs> And so anyway, he was happy and enjoying his kind of peaceful, peaceful state of mind. Okay? He was immersed in kind of uh, this attainment. See? And he didn't have any intention to, to go back to the world of samsara and teach. Okay? He didn't have any intention. But the legend tell, tells us that after having spent 28 days in samadhi, Brahma, the highest god of Brahmanism, or the highest god in Hinduism, appeared before him and asked him to go out into the world of samsara and teach people. But Shakyamuni refused to do so. And Shakyamuni told the Brahma, even if I teach, people will not, un will not understand me. They will be confused by my teaching. He said, I, no, I don't, I'm not going to go out and teach. This dialogue between Shakyamuni and the Brahma symbolizes the debate that was going on in Shakyamuni's mind. Uh, here, the Brahma uh, represented the people's desire, okay? people's desire that Shakyamuni come back to the world of samsara and teach them. So Shakyamuni heard this kind of voiceless request of the people in the samsara. Although he refused to teach, he was kind of debating in his mind, okay? he was debating if he should go back or not. If Shakyamuni had stayed, stayed in the world of samadhi where no word was spoken, Buddhism would not have existed. Okay? The, you know, and he died with his enlightenment, nobody could share it. Okay? That, that could have happened. Then no, no one would have understood the contents of his enlightenment. See, if he, he remained there, he must have become the so-called Pracheka Buddha. See, Pracheka Buddha means a loner of Buddha, the individual Buddha. He was happy himself, but nobody could understand what he attained. Okay? 
But after some thinking, Shakyamuni decided to stand up. Stand up. He was sitting, you know, in the trance. But now he, he stood up and went back to the world of samsara. And he started to teach. This decision to teach was very crucial. This, this is a divine, this is a, a, a divine line between two types of Buddhahood. Okay. If we stay there, just the Hinayana Buddhahood. See? This coming back, this is the Mahayana Buddhahood. See? We can talk about two types of Buddha. Hinayana Buddha is the one who goes there just to enjoy individual attainment. See? Mahayana Buddha comes back here. One Japanese scholar, uh, Susumu Yamaguchi, uh, used this term static Buddha and dynamic Buddha. He said there are two types of Buddhas, static Buddha, sitting Buddha, and dynamic Buddha, the standing Buddha. See? So that differentiates the Hinayana Buddhahood and Mahayana uh, Buddhahood. Uh, so <laughs> fortunately, we are happy because he came back see? and he verbalized. The important thing is he used the words. See? He used the words to explain the, the contents of his enlightenment. So people are able to hear him, they underst understand him. And people are able to attain the same enlightenment Shakyamuni attained. Without his teachings, without people's listening to those words, okay, nothing happened. Actually, there was no Buddhism. Okay. Shakyamuni went back to the, the place called the Benares, Deer Park in the Benares, and he started to verbalize. He started to give teachings to the five practitioners. Actually, he used to practice with these five practitioners. So he, he, he started to speak to them. They, they started to hear his words. And that was the beginning of Buddhism. See? Beginning of Buddhism means the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha started to appear first time in history, see? Without the formation of Sangha, there was no Buddhism. Okay, so the, uh, so let me ex explain what Shakyamuni uh, did, okay? So the, as I said, Shakyamuni, the whole direction was turned around, okay? Now he came back this way, he came back and, uh, so, okay, he, he, this is human, see? And, if I put his hands on the legs, okay, hands on hands on the legs, okay, <laughs> okay. Shakyamuni came back and he started to speak. Okay. He started to speak. Uh, this is his eye and this is his big mouth. <laughs> and he started to speak these words. Okay. See, here important thing to know is there are two worlds. Okay, two types of people. You no, know, Shakyamuni is an awakened one, belonging to this. This is Dharma. Okay? Dharma goes this way, dynamic flow of life, impermanent. But people here are attached to this way. You know, people have this attachment to dualistic values. See? I have pluses, I hate minuses. So people uh, create the objects of an attachment using dualistic things. See? Good and evil, right and wrong, see? happy and unhappy. When people just love these pluses, hate minuses. Okay? So the, this is a world of delusion, okay? samsara. Okay? People use this dualistic, dualistic thinking. Okay, this is our regular wisdom. Okay? Uh, have you happened to be living our lives like this? Love pluses and hate minuses. We want to be happy. We reject the suffering. See, uh, we love beautiful things. We hate ugly things. See, this is dualistic. This is human wisdom. This is the common sense way of thinking. All of us have been using. Actually, we don't know anything except this wisdom, okay? See, but this is a cause, Buddha would call this ignorance, see? Cause of suffering, because of this attachment to fixed values created on the basis of this, because of this, see, attachment to this, the dualistic values, we are suffering, okay? The cause of this, this is a wisdom for us, but for, from Shakyamuni's view, this is ignorance. Uh, so that this is totally, see, that this is the way people live, okay? So the Shakyamuni came 
out of this the world of you know sphere of uh, to ultimate truth actually words don't exist here so he must come back here and use the, the same words deluded people are using words contain the elements of delusion see dualistic words are dualistically constructed okay so the people are using words in this context see now shall we come back to this world and he has to use the words see so that it's very he's doing something very difficult something almost impossible using the words see, to teach these people that's very difficult okay why you know they, so the, the traditionally okay, the words that he, he spoke the each word the each word is designed to teach this direction see? these he uses words to explain this see here or each word is going but people think he's always going this way see? this way these are the words that challenges this. See, the holistic king thinking. See, uh, what Shakyamuni is doing is one thing, and pe what people understand is another. See, that is a, a difficulty. See, so the, let me explain the meaning of this. Okay, word, okay. please look at this. Uh, 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 I know the B here, page one. Uh, Okay, you know, I, I titled this B, Unbridgeable Gap Between Shakyamuni's Words and Human Understanding of Words. See? Uh, so the Shakyamuni's words are defined this way, okay? The flow from the pure Dharma realm. This is a term used in the Yogacara, okay? I'm explaining Yogacara view of hearing, okay? So, so this, this is, I say Shakyamuni's words are defined as flow from the pure Dharma realm. See? What does this mean? See, flow from the pure Dharma realm. See? See, this is Dharma realm. Mm -hmm. See? So the, see, these words are see, uh, representing this flow. Mm -hmm. Same flow. See? See? It's a pure, pure pure dharma flow, see? Mm -hmm. Each word he Shakyamuni uses is designed to challenge these people, okay? Uh, it's a, this is the, see, uh, the word, each word is designed to show people this is the direction you should understand, okay? So, so the, see, the, and so the, this is, if I use the word the dharma here, this is dharma, okay, this is dharma. And these words are called the dharmas. See? Dharma. The, that, that word, same that word, the Dharma is used in, in two different ways. This is the ultimate truth that is beyond the words. Okay? And Dharma, this means teachings. See? Dharma could mean the ultimate truth that is beyond the words. And teachings. See? So, so the Shakyamuni is converting this, this Dharma, big D, singular, into plural. See? Lower case. See? These are the words without using these words, see, that, but this was designed to communicate this dynamic truth to these people. These people are attached to the dualistic values. Okay, so the, uh, I, next, uh, I mentioned problems in human understanding of Shakyamuni's words. See, as I said, see, people are attached, see, attached to their, their dualistic thinking. Shakyamuni is liberated from these dualistic values, see? Because this is attached fixed values, but he's liberated. He's no longer attached to fixed values. Reality is changing, okay? What we consider good could turn into evil. What, what we consider purity could turn into impurity, see? Everything changes, but it's only in our minds that we maintain the fixed values, see? Shakyamuni is totally liberated from the, all the fixed values we create in our minds. We have become attached to them. Okay? But Shakyamuni realized this absolute truth, Dharma, continuous flow of life, continuous change in reality. Okay? He become one with it. And that's what he wants want to communicate to the people. Okay? So the, <laughs> here, the problems, see, people, 
how can it be, be these people who cherish the dualistic understand Shakyamuni is worse? Okay? So that's why I said Shakyamuni is doing something almost impossible. Yeah. See? Uh, so I, I, you know, I give you one or you know, two examples to show the difficulties <coughs> or the, the problems the contained in human understanding. For example, Shakyamuni used the word happy, happy. Oh, oh you know, uh, Shakyamuni talks about, oh, no, uh, I'm talking about happiness. The people should, have, uh, should attain this happy, uh, land of happiness. Okay? He, talk, he used the word happy. See? That same word humans use. Without using word, people cannot understand. But what he means by the word happy is different from the, the word happy people understand here. See? He goes, happy here means, see, oh, ha oh, 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 I know the word happy here. Okay? Then people say, oh, happy, happy means happiness means that we don't have any suffering. See? See? So always have this kind of dualist concept. See? Dualist concept. So, the, oh, Shakyamuni is talking about happy. Oh, we, you know, he's talking about the sphere. We don't, we no longer have suffering or difficulty. Oh, happy land, see? Happy land. Oh, like uh, Orange County, nice, uh, you know, nice climate. And a lot of nice situations. See, we think about this happy land, see? Happy land, see? And no, no longer we have any difficulty that difficult. But when Shakyamuni uses the word happy, he doesn't mean that. He doesn't mean that. For Shakyamuni, happy means that you are, you are able to accept both difficulties and you know, happiness. And ha see, you, you no longer hate difficulties of life. You accept them. Okay? That's a tr transcending this dualistic thinking is a happiness that Shakyamuni is talking about. But see, as soon as he, we hear the word, Happy, we always think realistically, and oh, Shakyamuni is talking about happiness, you no know, absence of suffering. But the Shakyamuni talks about happiness. No, that's not what that you know, realistic happiness we think about. See? You 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 gain Buddha's wisdom, see? Then you have you, you could appreciate both pluses and minuses. You could find a deep meaning, see, positive meaning, even in Negative things. You are no longer afraid of suffering, difficulties of life. See, that's a happy life. See, you understand? Shakyamuni's mm -hmm. happiness and Shakyamuni's happiness means putting an end to this attached. See, attached. This is happy, happy. See, Dharma-based life is happy, happy life. See, this being liberated from this. But people, as soon as he, they hear the word happy, oh, he's talking about this happiness. And, oh, this is the place I no longer have. See, if, oh, I want to go to that kind of happy land. See, totally misunderstand what Shakyamuni intends to teach. Okay? And let me talk about pure land, too. See, pure land. This is, let's see, pure land. And what do you think about the, uh, what, what do you think about the pure land when you think, hear the word pure land? See, you always think, you know, here, we all think, oh, if we go there, there's no impurity there. See, we have only purity. See, that's it, the only pure land we can think of because we are attached to dualistic thinking. See, it is, on, see, but that's not what pure land means. See? When Shakyamuni talks about people who must be born in pure land, what does that pure land mean? Pure land is a Dharma land. See? Dharma land. You must be born here. That means this is in pure land. This, is in, this dualistic thinking is in, in pure. This is, see, non dualistic wisdom non-discriminative wisdom, the opposite of this is called land of purity. See? Purity means Buddha's wisdom. See? Buddha's human wisdom is 
impure. See? 